Hello, so we did the isoperimetric theorem last time and there are certain small things that I had left for you to figure out. Probably you have figured it out yourself but let us just tie up these loose ends before taking up the next application. So a couple of things we had left out. First the area formula. When you take a closed curve C, a simple closed curve. What is the area enclosed by the closed curve? Last time I wrote the formula integral x dy, integral x dy, the line integral x dy where the curve is traced counterclockwise gives you the area enclosed by the curve. This is a consequence of the Green's theorem. I mentioned it's a consequence of Green's theorem. So let me formally tell you how to get that. So let's recall the Green's theorem. Okay, so you see in the slide the statement of Green's theorem integral over the curve C P dx plus Q dy is a double integral del Q by del x minus del P by del y dx dy over the interior of the curve. So now you take Q equal to x and P equal to 0. P equal to 0 so this term goes away. Q equal to x so this becomes 1. dx dy is going to give you the area enclosed by the curve. Right hand side gives you the area enclosed by the curve. Left hand side gives you integral x dy. Integral x dy and that completes the formula for the area enclosed by the curve. The other thing I left out for you to think about is the stuff about arc length. Now let us recall that if you have a regular smooth curve gamma parameterized by the interval a b. So gamma from a b to r2 is a regular smooth curve. What is a regular smooth curve? A, we say that a curve is a regular smooth curve with the derivative is not equal to 0. I can always make that assumption that the derivative is not 0. So now let us look at the arc length function. The arc length function measured from a specific point. Let us call that arc length function s of t. Then in elementary calculus courses, you would have seen the formula ds by dt equal to ds by dt equal to mod gamma dot t that you see on the slide. So square both sides, ds by dt the whole squared equal to mod gamma dot t the whole squared, which is dx by dt the whole squared plus dy by dt the whole square. This is the equation that you get for the arc length. Now we need to use the relation between t and s. That is this relation that you see over here. t equal to 2 pi s upon l. So dt by ds is 2 pi by l. So ds by dt is l upon 2 pi. So we get this dx by dt the whole square plus dy by dt the whole square equal to ds by dt the whole square. That is l squared upon 4 pi squared. When you integrate both sides from minus pi to pi and divide by 1 upon 2 pi, you get exactly L squared by 4 pi squared that is 2.10. So that point has now been clarified. The next thing that we have to clarify is the thing about the Parseval formula. Now first of all, let us take f and g to be in L2 of minus pi pi. I am going to assume that f and g are real valued. Otherwise, you'll have to put the complex conjugates in the appropriate places. It's not difficult for you to figure out what to do. But let's stick to reals for now. And let us assume that f has Fourier coefficients alpha naught, alpha n's and beta n. So alpha naught plus summation alpha n cos nx plus beta n sin nx. And for g, it is gamma naught plus summation n from 1 to infinity gamma n cos nx plus delta n sin nx. Okay. So with that out of the way, what is the Fourier coef what is the Fourier series for f plus g and f minus g? It will be the alphas plus gammas respectively the betas plus deltas. For f minus g it will be alpha minus gamma and the respectively beta minus deltas. 
So you can write down the Fourier coefficients for f plus g and f minus g. We can write down the Parseval formula for f plus g and f minus g. Let us write down the Parseval formula for f, f plus g and f minus g. So I am combining the two in one formula 1 upon 2 pi integral minus pi to pi mod ft plus minus gt whole square dt equal to the coefficient of the constant term square. Remember we are in the real domain so no need to put absolute values. So alpha naught plus minus gamma naught squared plus one half summation n from 1 to infinity alpha n plus minus gamma n squared plus beta n plus minus delta n the whole squared. So this is the Parseval formula for f plus g and f minus g. Subtract, subtract and you can get, you can get the next equation. 1 upon 2 pi integral minus pi to pi ft gt equal to alpha naught gamma naught plus 1 half summation n from 1 to infinity alpha n gamma n plus beta n delta n. So this is the formula that we are using and we are using this formula where f of t is x of t and g of t is y prime of t. Did it, remember the area formula line integral x dy but you are going to parameterize the curve right. So it's going to be integral x t dy by dt dt and the parameter t goes from minus pi to pi and so you are applying the Parseval formula for the case when f of t equal to x of t and g of t equal to y prime of t. Now you have the Fourier series for y and you want to find the Fourier series for y prime. So once you write down the Fourier series for y, how do you write down the Fourier series for y prime? Simply do the term by term differentiation. But how do you know that the term by term differentiation is a valid operation? Remember that our curve is assumed to be a smooth curve which means that xt and yt are smooth 2 pi periodic functions. When you have smooth 2 pi periodic functions, the Fourier series can be differentiated term by term because the series of derivatives will converge uniformly. So you get the Fourier series for x of t, you get the Fourier series for y prime of t and then you got to put them in the appropriate places. That's how we got the n factor over here. Over here we got this, we picked up a n here and the minus sign came because the cosine term had to be differentiated. So we put all these things together and we get the result. And so those three small things which I had left for you to verify have now been completed. Now we will go to the next application of Parseval formula that is the maximum modulus theorem in complex analysis. This is one of the most important theorems in complex analysis. And let me state the theorem first. Suppose f is a non-constant holomorphic function on a connected domain omega in the complex plane and mod f is bounded in omega and the supremum of f cannot be attained at any point of d. Supremum of f cannot be attained at any point of d. Assume that the maximum modulus is attained at a point in omega, proved by contradiction. Assume the contrary. That is, you see what I written in red. So we may assume that this point at which the mod f attains its supremum is at the origin. Take a closed disk D, take a closed disk D of radius r centered at the origin and contained in omega. The power series for f converges absolutely and uniformly in D. And so you see in the display the power series for f of z. f of z is a0 plus a1z plus a2z square plus da da da. Put z equal to r e to the power i theta, a0 plus r e to the power i theta plus r squared e to the power 2 i theta plus da da da. Little r varies from 0 to capital R, theta varies from 0 to 2 pi of course. And we recognize here a Fourier series for the 2 pi periodic function theta going to f of e to the power i theta. We see a Fourier series appearing here. And then let us now fix a little r and let us use the Parseval formula for this particular Fourier series. It says for a fixed r with 0 less than r less than capital R we compute integral 0 to 2 pi mod f of r e to the power i theta the whole square d theta. We simply expand this thing 
write mod f is f f bar write it as f f bar f is a naught plus a1 r e to the power i theta plus etc write the corresponding series with complex conjugates and we pick up a m a n bar e to the power i n theta e to the power minus i m theta minus because of the complex conjugation and you integrate from 0 to 2 pi you take the integration under the summation term by term integration is valid because for a fixed r with 0 less than r less than or equal to r remember that the closed disk is contained in my domain of holomorphy omega so the series will converge uniformly and so I am allowed to take the integration inside the summation and the only term that survives is when n equal to m and so you get 2 pi times summation n from 0 to infinity mod a n squared. I already answered this question how to justify the exchange of summation and integration. What we see in the displayed equation is exactly the Parseval formula for the function theta going to f of r e to the power i theta. Now by our very assumption that this function attains its maximum modulus at the origin. But at the origin, the value of the function is a naught. So we get mod f of r e to the power i theta less than or equal to mod f, f of 0. There is mod a naught. So we infer that 2 pi times summation n from 0 to infinity mod a n squared from the top display which is equal to integral 0 to 2 pi mod f of r e to the power i theta the whole square d theta. But this entire thing the integrand is less than or equal to a naught. So it's less than or equal to 2 pi times mod a naught squared. And so this forces a1 to be 0, a2 to be 0, a3 to be 0, etc. So the, it means that the function f is constant on the disk of radius capital R centered at the origin. The power series collapses to a constant. So the function f is constant on the disk of radius capital R centered at the origin. Now how do we proceed from there? How do you, how do you infer that the function f must be constant throughout omega? It's a simple connectedness argument that I leave it to you because the connectedness argument that I am leaving out is not relevant for Fourier analysis but it is a routine argument that you have seen in your complex analysis courses several times. So I leave that part. So that proves the maximum modulus theorem. So I have given you now two applications of Parseval formula, one to complex analysis and other to a famous geometrical problem. Now let us proceed a little further and let us look at some applications to partial differential equations. Let us look at the Laplace's equation on a disk. So we apply the theory of Fourier series for studying some classical differential equations. The most basic differential equation is the Laplace's equation and we shall do it for the two dimensional Laplace's equation del 2 by del x squared plus del 2 by del y squared. And we will work with the unit disk x squared plus y squared less than or equal to 1. The problem is to find a twice continuously differentiable function u such that Laplacian of u is 0 on the disk and the value of u on the boundary cos theta sin theta is f of theta where f is a 2 pi periodic function of theta. We are going to assume that f is Lipschitz and 2 pi periodic. Why would you assume that f is Lipschitz? We want the Fourier series to converge point wise. First let us write this Laplace's equation in polar coordinates. Here is a little exercise for you to derive equation 2.12. Del 2 by del x squared plus del 2 by del y squared is del 2 by del r squared plus 1 upon r del del r plus 1 upon r squared del 2 by del theta squared. This is a standard thing in elementary calculus. So I will not derive this. So our PDE in polar coordinates become del 2 u by del r squared plus 1 upon r del u by del r plus 1 upon r squared del 2 u by del theta squared 2.13. So in this equation 2.13, we shall look for a solution of the form u of xy as a function of r and a function of theta. So we use the method of separation of variables. 
where g theta is a 2 pi periodic function. So let us substitute this particular object in the differential equation 2.13. So u equal to v of r g of theta. So the, the first term will become v double prime r g theta. The second term del u by del r will be v prime r g theta. The third term will be v of r g double prime theta. So when you do that, we get this equation r squared v double prime plus r v prime by v equal to minus g double prime by g. Left hand side is a function of r alone, right hand side is a function of theta alone. So both sides must be constant and let us call this constant k squared. And so we get two ODEs r squared v double prime plus r v prime minus k squared v equal to 0 g double prime theta plus k squared g theta equal to 0. The first one is a Cauchy Euler equation which is familiar to you and its solutions are a r to the power k plus b r to the power minus k and the second differential equation is the differential equation for a harmonic oscillator g theta equal to c cosine k theta plus d sine k theta. So far so good. Now since g is a 2 pi periodic function, we must have that k must be an integer. Because if k is not an integer, the right hand side will not be periodic with period 2 pi. We want at least one of the c or the d to be non-zero because if both of them are zero, we are looking at the zero solution which is not interesting. So in order to get 2 pi periodic solutions, this k must necessarily be an integer. And the solution is continuous at the origin and so this k must be non-negative and then the b must be 0. So we get, so this b must be 0 and so this vr into g theta, what is vr into g theta? r to the power k into cos k theta, there is a c here, sin k theta and there is a d and this a can be clubbed with a c and the a can be clubbed with a d. You can call a c as c tilde, a d as d tilde. There is no need to put the d tilde and c tilde again. There is some other constant. I call the constant a k and b k if you like. Now you got a special solution. What is the special solution? r to the power k, a k cos k theta, r to the power k, b k sin k theta. Now you can have more general solutions by taking linear combinations or superpositions. Of course, when k is 0, that also has to be considered. The k is 0 means it is a constant, you get the a naught term. So the most general solution is displayed here as equation 2.14, the last displayed in the slide. So u of r cos theta r sin theta equal to a naught plus summation n from 1 to infinity r to the power n a n cos n theta plus b n sin n theta. Now we got the problem of computing a naught a n and b n. How to do that? We simply put r equal to 1. Simply put r equal to 1 and recall that when r equal to 1 u of cos theta sin theta is f of theta. Now we have to bring in the Fourier series. So, so we put r equal to 1 and we get f of theta equal to a naught plus summation n from 1 to infinity a n cos n theta plus b n sin n theta that is display 2.15 in the slide. And from this equation we can at once deduce a, a naught a1 etc and b, b1 b2 etc. Simple a naught is simply what? 1 upon 2 pi integral f of theta d theta from minus pi to pi. What is a n? 1 upon pi integral minus pi to pi f of theta cos theta d theta etc. The, the formulas for the Fourier coefficients. So the, a not, so the a's and the b's, the coefficients can be determined uniquely. So here are some exercises. Simple instance f of theta is mod sin theta, f of theta is mod sin theta, it is obviously Lipschitz. Now if I take the function to be Lipschitz then we know that the Fourier series will actually converge. In fact we can even prove that the series will converge uniformly. So mod sin theta is certainly a Lipschitz function and you can calculate the a's and the b's. 
Of course, the b will be 0 because it's an even function. So, there will, the sign term will not be there. Another exercise, show that if u is harmonic, then the average value 1 upon 2 pi integral minus pi 2 pi u of r cos theta r sin theta d theta is u of 0, 0. The mean value of the function along a circle, you are integrating u along a circle r cos theta r sin theta and you are dividing by 1 upon 2 pi and you are going to get the value in the center. This is called the mean value theorem for harmonic functions. Simply integrate 2.15 term by term, you will get the result. So, we have proved two important theorems. So, let us continue with the formula that we obtained in the last slide. So, now we got u of r e to the power i theta, we got a naught plus summation n from 1 to infinity r to the power n a n cos n theta plus b n sin n theta. But we know the formula for these coefficients and let us put the formulas for these coefficients and we will get u of r e to the power i theta equal to 1 upon 2 pi integral minus pi 2 pi f of t dt plus 1 upon pi summation n from 1 to infinity r to the power n cos n theta times what is the formula for a n minus pi to pi integral f of t cos n t dt. Similarly, plus sin n theta integral minus pi to pi f of t sin n t dt. Now, what we are going to do is that we are going to club these two integrals together and we are going to bring the integration outside the summation. So, the integrals decay to 0 by riemann lebesgue lemma and by riemann lebesgue lemma since the coefficients are decaying to 0 and r is less than 1, it is easy to justify the exchange of summation and integration. So, when you do the exchange of summation and integration, what you are going to get is outside you got 1 upon 2 pi integral minus pi 2 pi and everything else is inside the integral sign all the terms have f t in common. So, f t d t. So, what is the other factor? 1 plus twice summation n from 1 to infinity r to the power n cos n theta cos n t plus sin n theta sin n t. Okay. Now, cos a cos b plus sin a sin b is cos of a minus b as you all know. We use that formula. And we get what? We get 1 plus twice r to the power n cos n s is 1 minus r squared upon 1 plus r squared minus 2 r cosine s, the middle exercise. How do you do this exercise? 1 plus summation n from 1 to infinity 2 r to the power n cos n x. How do you find the sum of that? Write cos n s as 1 half of e to the power i n s plus e to the power minus i n s. What you get are simply two geometric series, two individual geometric series and r is strictly less than 1. So, these two geometric series individually converge, write down the sums of those two geometric series, do the simple algebra and you get this 1 minus r squared by 1 plus r squared minus 2 r cosine s. It is a very easy exercise. You please do it and we get the result u r e to the power i theta equal to 1 upon 2 pi integral minus pi 2 pi 1 minus r squared upon 1 plus r squared minus 2 r cos theta minus t. And there is an f t dt of course. 2.18. This expression 1 minus r squared upon 1 plus r squared minus 2 r cos theta minus t is called the Poisson kernel with a 1 upon 2 pi thrown in. It is called the Poisson kernel. So, this Poisson kernel is going to play a very important role in what is going to come. We are going to use this to discuss Abel summability and many other things. So, the solution of our problem, so the solution to our problem 2.11 has been expressed as an integral. Remember right at the first lecture, I mentioned to you that integral representations were preferred in classical, in classical mathematics. It's, it's preferred because it is easy to do estimates. 
or we're using integrals. So the solution to this Laplace's equation with boundary conditions f of theta can be written as a integral with respect to the Poisson kernel. That solution has been expressed as equation 2.18. I think it's a good time to stop this lecture here and we'll continue with this in the next capsule. Thank you very much.